Hey, it's Will from LearnRator, and in this video I'm going to walk you through game theory, which is a concept that's frequently tested on the AP Microeconomics exam. Game theory is a really important concept to understand because it's usually a pretty simple game to solve, but as long as you know how to approach the question. So let's go ahead and walk through a few examples. So these are all practice questions from AP Central. Um, if you don't know about AP Central, it's a site in which you can get a lot of different practice materials for past FRQs. And what I'm going to do as I walk through these different game theory examples is I'm going to walk you through what I'm thinking as well as how to approach these questions. Most of the time in AP, in AP Microeconomics, you're faced with a two by two game in which you'll have two players as well as two payoffs to consider. And what you want to think about once you look at this is you want to think about, first of all, which one is player one's actions and which one's player two's actions. So in this case, as is usually the case, the player on the left-hand side is player one, and then the player at the top is player two. So what that means is that the first number in these respective boxes is player one, and then the second number is player two. And as you walk through these games, what you want to think about is you want to think about how one player's actions influence the actions of the other player. In other words, what is the best response of a player with respect to the actions of the second player? So in this case, the way that I always approach games is by thinking about what player one does in response to an action by player two. So let's assume, for example, that La Pizza were definitely going to advertise. So in this case, what we want to do is you want to ignore the right-hand side of the matrix. And what you can do is you can just take your hand, cover over it, and then only look at these numbers on the left-hand side. And what you'll see is that player one is faced with two potential payoffs. They either have a payoff of 250 if they were to advertise, or they have a payoff of 180. And as we know, 180 is less than 250, and therefore, if La Pizza were to advertise, Pie crust would advertise as well. Now let's look at what happens if La Pizza were to not advertise. So again, like we just did, we want to cover the left-hand side of the matrix and look at the payoffs with respect to Pie Crust. In this case, Pie Crust can either advertise and get a payoff of 450, or they cannot advertise and get a payoff of 3, 390. So in this case, it makes sense for Pie Crust to advertise because a payoff of 450 is greater than 390. And we want to essentially repeat this technique with La Pizza, player two. So in this case, let's assume that Pie Crust is definitely going to advertise. So we want to go ahead and cover these bottom two uh, boxes, and we want to consider the payoffs on the top end of the matrix. So in this case, La Pizza can either advertise or not advertise. And if this were the case in which Pie crust were to advertise, La Pizza would go ahead and not advertise because the payoff would be 300 versus 200. Now let's look at what happens if Pie crust were to definitely not advertise. In this case, La Pizza can either advertise and get a payoff of 500 or not advertise and get a payoff of 400. So clearly they would choose advertise because 500 is greater than 400. And what you see here is you see one box in which we've underlined both payoffs of the players. And what this means when you have a situation in which both of these payoffs are underlined with respect to solving the game is that we've found ourselves a Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium essentially means that in this situation, given that the information we have is correct, both players have no incentive to deviate away from this, this overall solution. So a few things to consider when you think about AP Micro and what they're going to test you on. One of the things that they frequently test you on is if you can identify dominant strategies. And what dominant strategies are is essentially a strategy in which the player would always play that strategy regardless of what the other player does. In other words, take for example if La Pizza were to always play advertise regardless of if Pie Crust advertises or does not advertise. And in this case, we actually do have a dominant strategy. If we look at this, it seems that from this overall payoff matrix, that Pie Crust will always choose to advertise. In the case where La Pizza advertised, Pie Crust chose to advertise. And in the case where La Pizza did not advertise, Pie Crust still chose to advertise. So this would be a dominant strategy for Pie Crust. And in the case of La Pizza, 
we notice that he does not have a dominant strategy. And that's because if pie crust were to advertise, the best response of Lapizza would be to not advertise. However, if pie crust were to not advertise, the best response of Lapizza would be to advertise. And therefore, Lapizza's payoffs and what he decides to do depends on the overall action of pie crust. So in this case, that would be how you identify the dominant strategies. Something that's also frequently tested in terms of the AP exam is they often will throw a curveball at you by including additional subsidies or additional payoffs. So in the case, for example, in which they might say that there's an unexpected surplus for those that advertised, for example, let's say there were a third party agency that uh, was providing a $200 coupon in, in return if, they, if these firms advertised, then what you would want to do is you want to think about the situations in which firms choose to advertise and add 200 to every single firm that chose to do so. So in this case, in that situation where there was somebody offering a $200 additional payoff, this top left box would be 450 and 400 and then um, in this box, we would see 650, but 300 because La Pizza does not advertise in this particular scenario. So that's pretty much how you want to solve games. So really quickly, let's walk through a few more examples of how to solve some more two by twos, and then you should try for yourself by answering a few of the different FRQ questions available on on AP Central. So now let's look at the second example. We have Red Shop and Blue Mart. They have two actions of either positioning their stores in north or south. And let's first think about what Red Shop does if Blue, Shop, if Blue Mart were to position themselves in the north. So in this case, again, cover this right-hand side. Only think about the payoffs of Red Shop. In this case, we have 900 versus 5,000. So Red Shop would definitely go for the 5,000. Now let's look at the case in which um, let's look at the case in which Blue Mart were to position themselves uh, definitely in the south. So you cover up the left-hand side. You think about what would Red Shop do? Would they position themselves north or south? In this case, they will go north because 3,000 is greater than 1,500. Now let's look at what Blue Mart does in response to Red Shop. If they know that Red Shop is going to go north, then we can cover the bottom box, the bottom two boxes, and only consider the top two payoffs. And in this case, 3,500 is greater than 1,800. And then in the bottom, if Red Shop were to definitely position themselves in the south, Blue Mart would be faced with the decision between a payoff of 4,000 and 1,000. In this case, of course, Blue Mart would go ahead and go with 4,000. So what's interesting about this game versus the first game? Well, the first interesting insight is that in this situation, we've actually identified two different Nash equilibriums. So there are two different Nash equilibriums here. And what's also really interesting is the fact that in this situation, there's clearly no dominant strategy, right? Because if Red Shop were to always play south, they wouldn't get the best payoff they can always get in this overall game. Because if they were to play south regardless of what Bloom Art did, they would be losing out on a payoff, an additional payout of 1500 had they gone north. So what this shows you is that you can be presented with situations in which you don't have a dominant strategy. And so you don't want to feel, feel like you're trapped into answering that there is a dominant strategy if the FRQ question asks you that just because you know the question asks you that. Sometimes they can try to trick you by seeing if you just understand the core concept of what is a dominant strategy. So in this case, we have two Nash equilibriums, and clearly the actions of both players will interact with the actions of you know, the particular player that we're inquiring about. And, and overall, you know, this is a pretty straightforward game. Again, what they could do is they could include some sort of subsidy or additional payoff that they could include or some sort of expense. So let's say, for example, if stores were to definitely locate in the north, there might be an extra tax of 450. So in this case, in this top left-hand box, this would become 450, and then this would become 1350. And then in this case, in which only red went north, this would be, you know, this would be uh, 3550, and then this would be um, just the same 3500. So. 
that just goes to show you a few examples of you know, how you can walk through this game. Let's go ahead and go through two more examples really quickly. So in this case, we are faced with Easy Ride and City Wheels, and um, they can either maintain fares or lower fares. In this case, let's first think about player one, Easy Ride. What if City Wheels definitely maintains their fare? Well then, Easy Ride is faced with the decision of maintaining their fares and experiencing a payoff of 150, or lowering their fares and getting a payoff of 120. In this case, they should maintain their fares at 150. Now let's look at the situation in which uh, City Wheels definitely lowers their fares. In this case, Easy Ride will definitely lower their fares as well because 140 is greater than 130. Now let's look at City Wheels situation. If Easy Ride definitely maintains their fares, then what's going to happen is City Wheel is going to match them here because 180 is greater than 120. And then again, let's look at the last situation in which Easy Ride definitely lowers fares. In this case, City Wheels can either maintain fares for 130 or they can lower fares for 110. They choose to maintain fares. So what is the dominant strategy here? Well, in this case, Easy Ride does not have a dominant strategy because their action depends on City Wheels' action. However, City Wheels, as we can see here, will always choose to maintain their fares. So this is a dominant strategy here. And then again, this top left corner is going to be a Nash Equilibrium so these players have no incentive to deviate when they reach this outcome. Finally, let's look at this example. We have roadway and rank and wheels. They can either be early or late. First, let's look at roadway. Again, start from the left-hand side, ignore the right. So if rank and wheels definitely goes early, then roadway will go early as well because 1,000 is greater than 750. Going to the right side, ignoring the left. In this case, roadway will go 950 because 950 is greater than 700, so they'll go early. And then finally, ranking wheels, if roadway goes early, then ranking wheels will definitely go early as well because 900 is greater than 850. And then finally, if roadway goes late, then ranking wheels will definitely go late as well. So what's interesting about this game? Well, again, we have a Nash equilibrium here. And we also have a dominant strategy for player one because no matter what ranking wheels does, roadway will always play early. So that is a dominant strategy here. And um, we have a Nash equilibrium here. And so what's interesting, you know, in two by two games, there's really not too much they can confuse you on. But if you notice this top example versus this bottom example, the bottom example had these two different players acting differently. And then here we have player one acting differently. Uh, and then it happening on the right hand side rather than on the bottom two uh, cells. So overall, when you are solving any game theory question, the questions you want to ask yourself um, include, what will I do in response to the other player? What is the dominant strategy, if there are any at all? And then finally, what are the Nash equilibriums? And then optional, sometimes they'll ask you this, um, in the case where there is an additional payoff or subsidy, which ones do I actually have to adjust uh, when I'm redrawing the particular payoff matrix? So that pretty much covers it for this video. As always, if you need extra practice, feel free to check out learnerator.com for hundreds of AP micro and macro questions. Um, it's a really great way to practice, and that's it for now. I'll see you guys next time.